the Mustang, the Thunderbird, the Crown Victoria. Since 1903, the Ford Motor Company has been responsible for some of the most iconic cars ever. But as the world changes and new trends emerge, Ford has announced the company will stop selling sedans in North America. When I heard the news, I was shocked. I asked my coworkers what they thought, but they were speechless too. So on this episode of Wheelhouse, we're gonna find out why. The American automotive industry has always adapted to the world around it. Cars have helped shape pop culture, but if you look closer, cars are a product of the time and not vice versa. Cultural and socioeconomic events influence car design more than one single person ever could. It may be cliche, but the Model T changed how the world viewed cars in the early 20th century. Automobiles were seen as a luxury and therefore inaccessible to common people. Rather than court aristocrats who already owned luxury motor carriages, Henry Ford chose to pursue a demographic that had been neglected, blue collar working people who didn't know they needed cars. Not only was the Model T redefining how cars were sold, it was also revolutionizing how cars were made. In 1913, Ford introduced the automated assembly line, which brought production time down from 12 hours to two and a half. The Model T was probably the most famous instance in which a car company succeeded by adapting a new business model. Fast forward to 1973. American cars were gigantic, inefficient, but looked cool as hell. Small Japanese imports felt wimpy by comparison. The Chrysler Imperial LeBaron was the biggest of the bunch, clocking in at 19.6 feet. The 439 cubic inch 7 liter V8 cranked out 208 horsepower and got a whopping 9.8 miles per gallon. Pretty extravagant, but all the extravagance of the early 70s was short-lived. OPEC, short for the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, is a group that includes Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. The organization was outraged that the U.S. had supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War and proclaimed an oil embargo against the U.S. The price of gas nearly tripled over the course of the next year. Suddenly, those small, efficient Japanese imports didn't look so bad. They had great MPG and were reliable. That meant that drivers didn't have to wait in long lines to fill up on gas. And the Japanese weren't the only ones giving American car manufacturers a headache. The federal government introduced the CAFE regulations in 1975. CAFE? CAFE? C-A-F-E? CAFE is how I'm going to say it. The federal government introduced the CAFE regulations in 1975 to improve fuel efficiency in U.S. produced vehicles and light trucks. This throttled back performance, a pretty important selling point for American vehicles at the time. Gone were the days of the muscle cars and thus began the era of small, cheap, and efficient commuters. The only American-made vehicles comparable to Japanese imports were cars like the AMC Gremlin and Ford Pinto, notoriously crappy beaters. Cadillac even came out with the Cimarron, an 88 horsepower sports luxury abomination that delivered neither luxury nor sport in terms of ride quality. American car manufacturers were destroying their reputation by trying to compete with Japanese sedans and they were losing. However, consumers were finding that they could still get the power and room they expected from US made vehicles by purchasing one of the few vehicle types which were not subject to cafe regulations, trucks. U.S. manufacturers like Ford and Chevrolet focused on making their trucks better because the market demanded it, and they were less restricted by regulations. As their car division became less and less relevant, their trucks surged to the front of the pack. Cut to present day. The F-150 is the best-selling vehicle in America, and Ford just hired a new CEO in Jim Hackett. The previous CEO was laid off because of stagnant stock prices, rising production costs, and so-called uninspired vision when it came to the Ford product line. Historically, Ford has always had rigid leadership and business models, and Hackett's free-thinking methods are all but rigid. In addition to quoting theoretical physicists, Hackett uses words like fitness, auto 2.0, and design thinking when explaining the direction he has planned for Ford. But when it comes time to actually describe what all that means, Hackett falls a little short. I guess you could say he doesn't hack it. No, stupid. All right. <laughs> The new CEO might sound more like the head of a new age startup rather than a major car company, but to be fair, he does have some progressive ideas that could usher in a new era for Ford. Whether that's good or bad is up to you. Hackett's vision for Ford is to transform it from a car company into a mobility company. 
His emphasis is to make smart vehicles for a smart world and focus on developing electric vehicles, self-driving systems, and ride-sharing systems. The company recently acquired a majority stake in autonomous vehicle engineering firm Argo AI. They've invested in Japanese tech company SoftBank and rolled out a plan to invest $11 billion in an electric vehicle development soon to be built in Detroit. I tried looking up what Argo AI and SoftBank actually do, but their websites are incredibly vague. Yeah, they do autonomous vehicles and technology. With all that expensive innovation happening, something has to be sacrificed. The sacrificial lambs are the Taurus, the C-Max, and the Fiesta. The Focus line was going to continue as a weird lifted variant thing called the Focus Active, but Ford was planning on building them in China, making them subject to the new tariffs. Tariffs that put a 10% duty tax on top of what it already takes to import goods from China. So Ford said, all right, never mind, and canceled the Focus Active altogether. This means the Mustang is Ford's only traditional car left in their lineup for the foreseeable future. Those pet boys really like them burnouts, huh? Hackett and the board of directors at Ford saw the competition with Japanese sedans and crossover SUVs as a losing battle. Americans have been loyal to Japanese sedans since the 70s, which is when they started topping best car lists. Plus, Ford sees 90% of sales coming from trucks, SUVs, and commercial vehicles. So contextually, as much as we might not like it, this move makes sense. It just really sucks to imagine that there might be a day without any Ford cars on the road at all. Thanks for watching Wheelhouse. We look at the issues that affect you in the car world every week. So hit that yellow subscribe button right there. We talked about tariffs on a previous episode. Check that out right there. The director of marketing at Kia said he learned a lot from it. So that's cool. <laughs>